I've been doing this more than half my life at this point. I, I created Pantera at 12, I'm 31. You don't get good at something by doing everything. I've had to focus and refocus and narrow out some more and narrow more. I was doing a lot. When I tell you I was hustling, I, I am a legitimate hustler. Like no one can out hustle me. I am not necessarily afraid of failing because in all honesty, I know a lot of amazing women. I know a lot of amazing people who who have achieved amazing things. And those people, when they share their stories with me, they're full of like, they're, they're full of failures. And I kind of feel like when you're trying to create greatness, like you can't do what everybody else is doing. There's nothing that you have that you weren't supposed to have. And there's nothing that you have that you weren't supposed to use. Put it out there. Put the work out there. Hi, this is Andrea Pitter, and you're listening to Dreams and Drive. Hey, Dream Drivers, this episode is brought to you by Camilla's Kitchen, maker of Caribbean-inspired, high-quality, handcrafted sauces, marinades, spices, and cakes. So I recently used their spicy mango chutney as a dipping sauce for these really, really good sweet honey lemon pepper shrimp that I made, and I totally loved it. The sauce was spicy, but it had this sweet, flavorful kick. Check out the Dreams and Drive Instagram TV to watch the full video. And if you want to support this black-owned food brand that was founded by a dream driver and her mother from Trinidad and Tobago, just use code DID10 for 10% off at checkout at camelotskitchen.com. Or you can visit dreamsanddrive.com slash Camilla and also use the code DID10 for 10% off at checkout. So today we have another special guest for you guys. We are going to be speaking with Andrea Pitter who's the founder and creative director of Pintora Bridal, and she's also the founder of Trap Fabrics. And today's episode is really all about learning how Andrea was able to take this dream that she had ever since she was 12 years old, uh, this dream of being a fashion designer, and truly make it a reality. So it started out as a hobby that eventually turned into a side hustle and then into a full-fledged, full-time business. Andrea is going to share the roadmap that she took to carving out a space for black design bridal to shine in an industry where black bodies are underrepresented and often excluded. This episode is going to touch on her ups, her downs, the uncertainties, and why Andrea always chose to bet on herself and her ideas. Uh, we even going to touch on how her business was impacted because of COVID and the steps that she and her team took to ensure that they were able to return to business. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you're sharing it with your communities and across your social media. You can find us across the board, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dreams and Drive. And use that hashtag Dreams and Drive when sharing as well. I love to see you guys screenshotting and sharing, especially I always go in and make sure I'm reposting everything. If you want to get our weekly newsletter, The Keys, just go to www.dreamsanddrive.com slash join. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash join to sign up. And lastly, make sure you check out the Dreams and Drive shop. If you have not already bought your Dreams and Drive t-shirt or crew neck sweatshirt, just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash shop. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash shop. We have a bunch of colors left, and I really want to see y'all rocking it this summer, all right? Let's get into this episode. So let us start. You know, I always love to go back in time and uh, I want you to think about the nine year old Andrea, right? Like that eight, nine year old, 10 year old. What was the dream for you back then? What was inspiring you as a child? I was super active, um, a little headstrong. And, <laughs> and when I say a little, I mean a lot. <laughs> you could not tell me no if it's what I wanted to do. I was likely going to do it anyway. And that was probably my mom's biggest pet peeve is she would tell me I could not do something and I would just find an around the way um, way to get it done. Um, I was loud, a little obnoxious, always busy, always working. There was always something I was going to be doing, like something I was going to be great at. Like there, you could not tell me that there wasn't something that I could not do. Um, and I just feel like nine-year-old me was really special because I was not afraid of anything. Were you, did you have this big dream as a kid? Like, did you say, all right, I want to be blank when I grow up? At nine, I wanted to be a lot of things. By 12, I knew that I was going to be a fashion designer. How did you know? I, like, how were you, you were like 100% certain, no doubt? I was 100% certain there was no doubt in my mind. I created the name Pantora when I was 12. 
And you, you could just could not tell me otherwise. I was actually doing some modeling. So I did like some commercials and, and, you know, things like that. And you could always find me in the costume department. That's where I was. I was hanging out with the designers, hanging out with the costume designers, um, with the tailors, anybody that had clothing, fabric, a pair of scissors, that's where I was. When they were calling for talent, they had to call my name several times. I, I was just always the last one on set because I was so interested in what was going on behind the scenes. We did fashion shows and I would, I'd be interviewing the designers. I didn't, I didn't really want to be there for any other reason, except that I felt really um, drawn to the actual fashion. So where do you think that love for fashion, that love for designing came from? I honestly don't know. I love details and I love problem solving. I can't say that like, I, I just like all of a sudden was just like, oh, oh my God, I saw this designer and I wanted to be a fashion designer. I don't think it happened like that for me. I think I kind of just fell into it. I liked um, to create things with my hand. I was always super creative. I always liked to draw. I always like to put things together. Um, if we got like small pieces of furniture, I would always want to help build it. So I was just naturally curious about how things are made. Okay. Okay. So 12 year old Andrea, you wanted to be a fashion designer. How did you say, what, what was next? Like, how were you actually going to start learning about the things you had to do in order to get this done? What was the, what was the blueprint you were creating at that point? Okay. So 12 year old me, I was in junior high. I was in a school called um, Crown School for Law and Journalism, and I did not want to be a lawyer or a journalist. Was that something <laughs> Jamaican parents yeah. said you got to do it? <laughs> and, 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 I feel like you know it. <laughs> you know it. My <laughs> sister actually went to that um, junior high, and my sister is super smart. If I if I could um, pick another sister, I absolutely wouldn't. She is the best role model, and my parents were like, you go where she goes. And that's kind of just what it was. And so that's what I did. But I don't I don't feel like I regret that. It um, it instilled a lot of like discipline. You do something, you kind of stick with it. Yeah, I ended up there. There was a, the high school of fashion industries. Um, it was time to go to high school. And my mom said, you're going to go to Brooklyn Tech. And I was like, I'm not going there. <laughs> you going in, not me. <laughs> I, I was just like, mm, not me. And she then I knew what my mother was capable of because I only ended up at Crown School for Law Journalism because my mother hid my accept my exception letter to another junior high that I wanted to go to. Okay. Did I say exception? Acceptance. <laughs> Acceptance letter. <laughs> no, I, I knew what you were saying. I knew what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> So my mom, she hid the acceptance letter to the junior high school that I did want to go to. And I knew that if I got into these specialized high schools, that my mom was going to make me go. And so I went, I took the test and I charlied out everything and still got in. And I was just like, this is not good. So I kind of um, started to realize that I wanted to be a fashion designer. And in order to do that, I had to kind of not be good at the other things that I was good at. And that was really hard because I loved math. I loved science. I loved learning. Um, I was really well-rounded as a child. I was in sports. So there's so many avenues that I could have taken, but I knew that in order for me to be a fashion designer, that I had to be really, really headstrong because my parents didn't see that as like an actual occupation. And, um, you know, I had to do research. I had to show them, well, you, you can be a textile designer. You can be a pattern maker. You can, you can do the advertising. You don't actually have to be, you know, the designer. And I kind of warmed them up to the idea. Um, I don't think they got really warm until I started making money. But I you know, them up every the parent, idea. right? <laughs> that's... that's. I mean, I think that it's in good nature. They just really want you to be successful so that you can um, sustain. But I think sometimes it's really important for um, not just children, because this is something that adults go through as well, to kind of really be steadfast in their dreams. And so in creating Pantora, I was 12, created the name Pantora because I wanted to go to, go to the high school of fashion industries, um, got in when I turned around 16, maybe my sophomore year in high school, someone said, I need you to make sweet 16 dresses for me. And I created their sweet 16 dress in their court. And that was like the first official Pantora order. That was like actual money that I could send. I was making like, um, handkerchief book bags out of the bandanas you get at the beauty supply store oh, wow. that's what I was doing <laughs> in junior high in junior high everyone was taking was giving me their orders for their custom 
handkerchief book bags in the lunchroom and my teachers were turning a blind eye to the fact that I was like hustling. I was a legitimate hustler. So, um, you know, that was like my first like entrepreneurial experience in, in junior high when I was taking these random orders. Um, but in high school is when I took like this official order for real clothing. And I was like, oh, I can do this. I can make money and I can do what I love. Um, and that's kind of really where Pantora was built. You know, I love what I love really about your story is not only your persistence, but that belief in self, right? And a lot of dream drivers, a lot of us sometimes, we know we have this gift, but there's just something that's not allowing us to share it to the world. What, you know, what would you say to that person who's really struggling with that? I kind of feel like God gives you something so you can show it off. And Mm -hmm. every single time, Every single time we kind of break through that nervousness, that anxiety about kind of using our talents and our gifts to kind of put us in a better situation, I I say it wasn't by accident. It's absolutely by design. Um, I'm spiritual. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I would necessarily align myself with like being religious, but I'm definitely spiritual. And I kind of feel like there's nothing that you have that you weren't supposed to have. And there's nothing that you have that you weren't supposed to use. Put it out there. Put the work out there. Yep. So you went to FIT in New York. So people who don't know, that's like the the top of the top, right? Like if you want to be a fashion designer and if you live in New York City, that's where you go, right? What do you think was the biggest thing that you got out of attending FIT? That's a, that's an interesting one. I always told, told people when I graduated, you shouldn't ask me anything about this FIT experience until <laughs> like I have like been out of college for a couple of years because I think that I absolutely deserve to be there, but I also felt like so many other people deserve to be there. And uh. this is this it's just an interesting experience to be one of one of few. <laughs> to me few campus. of Black women? Black people. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, I don't know the dialect of that. I don't know, like, how it breaks down. Because in my head, it's like New York City. You would think it's diverse, but it's really not. No, not at wow. all. Not at all. Um, I, I can't, I have been out of college for almost a decade, so I can't attest to what it is today. Okay. But I know that when I was in class, in order to be one of two, m- myself and a pair had to schedule it that way. We would get online and schedule our classes at the same exact time in order to be one of two. So my experience, FIT, it, it is almost the mecca. I would consider it like the mecca of fashion design. What I got out of it was that you have to take each experience as your own because no experience can be duplicated. I watched my pairs fall like flies. That first semester, I watched my pairs show up on the first two weeks of school and not come back. It was hard. It, it was It was really hard. And my first two years, I I took it for granted because I went to the high school of fashion industries. And the first two years of FIT is basically um, a duplicate of your last two years in the high school of fashion industries. So I kind of um, I kind of went there. I was a little a little cocky, not snooty at all, but a little cocky because I knew what I knew. And I also practiced and I also already had a business that was making money. So I took those first two years for granted and did not learn as much as I could have learned and did not experience college the way that I wish that I could have. Um, but those last two years, it was on. I learned everything. <laughs> I, I learned everything. Once I was able to kind of humble myself and say that if I'm going to be here and, and spend my good old tuition money, that I was going to make it an experience. And so I got to know my professors better. Um, I got to ask them about their actual experiences and how those experiences kind of could potentially save me money and mold me because I already knew that out of college that I would work corporate for a short period of time, but I wouldn't stay. Yeah. So I knew that I wouldn't stay, I wouldn't stay in corporate, but I knew that I needed to go because you need to make mistakes with other people's money. And that was one of the things that my professors kind of like ingrained in me, like, please just go work, go work, get some, get some experience because this is expensive and you are going to lose and waste a lot of money because you, you chose to be stubborn. 
you know, I was going to ask you, so as you were talking, I'm envisioning you, you know, the whole dreams and drive metaphor. I'm envisioning you like the end of, you know, you're, you're driving down this road and it's the end of college, right? Now you have this decision. You have a, you can either go down full-time entrepreneurship 100% or go work corporate. So I was going to ask you then, why was that corporate experience so important? Um, but you kind of alluded to it, like it really being the, the groundwork for you to play and for you to experience, for you to learn other people's dime, right? For sure. Learning on other people's dime, learning how businesses actually work. First of all, I think that um, black entrepreneurs were at a disadvantage because the resources that are available are just not available. So it, it was important for me to kind of just go work for people. I do think that my work experiences um, made me a little bit cynical, <laughs> but all in all, I learned a lot of things. I got a lot of contacts. Um, I understood the one thing that I understood very well was how I would not run my business. I mean, I can't tell you how I knew I was going to run it, but I knew I was not going to do it. I knew exactly how it would not be done. And, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't go out into the corporate world. So when was the moment for you where you were like, you know what, I'm done with this. It's time to really invest my all into Pantora. Wait, and at this point, was it, were you doing, were you just doing, were you designing all types of dresses? Because right now, you know, you were focused, you're focused on bridal, but was it like any type of design before? Or were you always, did you always have that desire to do like, you know, bridal wear? So uh, bridal, I had basically launched or did like a soft launch my senior year of college or okay. uh, junior year. And um, I, like, I knew I wanted to be a bridal designer, but I was designing ready to wear as well. I had a ready to wear line that was sold um, in a few stores across the country, but it wasn't something that I absolutely um, saw myself doing. I think that's fascinating because I, um, I'm actually launching a ready to wear line soon, but uh, I, I didn't see myself doing it because I loved bridal so much and I was spreading myself so thin that I knew that I was going to have to pick something and get really, really good at that thing. Um, so yeah, that's how I kind of ended up in bridal. Okay. And you know what? I think that's important, especially when you're starting out. A lot of people try to do too much and they try to be everything to everyone. Do you think focusing in on your niche of bridal was pivotal to where you are today? Absolutely. I've had to focus and refocus and narrow out some more and narrow more. <laughs> like I just had to keep narrowing it down because you don't get good at something by doing everything. And, um, I learned that lesson so many times and it cost me a lot of money. <laughs> you, you, you don't get to, you don't get to be great at something by doing everything. You really do have to kind of get good at something and then expand. What made you, or what was the moment for you where you decided I'm about to see where this Pantora bridal can take me. I want to do it full time. So, so Pantora bridal was making money. We, I was working consistently. I was putting in eight hours, um, at my nine to five. And then I was putting in another eight hours at Pantora and I was like kind of draining myself. And I remember I took the day off of work. Um, I was also like freelancing for Tottlewood and I took the day off of work to do. You were doing media. a lot. <laughs> I was doing a lot. When I tell you I was hustling, I, I am a legitimate hustler. Like no one can out hustle me. And I was, I was working for Tottlewood. I was the head designer for Tottlewood, um, even as a freelancer. And we had some media work to do. We were doing our media rounds. And I took the day off. And my higher up must have saw me on TV. This is, this is my assumption. I, she must have saw me on TV. And when I get to work, she started to inquire as to why I wasn't there. And I just felt like it was out of place. Um, I called in. I called in. I have all rights to call in. Um, she was just, it was just very interesting. The work environment was so toxic and she pulled me into her office and she's just like, so why weren't you in yesterday? And the questions became heavy and you can tell that she knew where I was. And I just felt like it wasn't a secret <laughs> where I was, wasn't a secret. It's just that I didn't owe you that information. And I remember, um, the way that I felt, I was like, you're not going to put me in a position to feel like this ever again. And so I took that week to really decide whether I was going to stay or not. And obviously it led to a not. I knew it wasn't going to work. And it, it, not just because of that experience with her, but I just felt like I felt like my business was making money and I did not need to subject myself to that kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. Were you nervous? Were you scared? 
Um, I was not scared to quit because I, I felt like I was hireable. So getting a job wasn't difficult for me. Um, I was scared when I realized I wasn't going back to a job. <laughs> <laughs> when I actually realized I was just like, okay, so you're not going to, the way things worked out was so interesting. I quit that job and my sister had lined up a trip for Paris and we were going to Paris maybe like a week or two after I had quit. And on this trip, I was like, what the hell did I just do? I'm in Paris. I don't really have money. My sister was out here balling and buying. And I was just like, girl, like, you see the money I got in my account? That that might need to, like, hold me out for a while. <laughs> so I, I wasn't scared until, like, towards the middle of this trip in Paris when I was just like, when I go back, what exactly am I doing? I was used to my nine to five check. And Pantora, while I was making money, I was putting that money back into figuring out you know, how to, to get really good at running this business and making sure that it was legitimate. So I wasn't really even looking at Pantora and saying, oh, profit. I was looking at it and saying, oh, use it to expand, take this money and, and expand, make it bigger, make it better. So yeah, I got, I got scared in the middle of this trip to Paris and I was just like, oh no, oh no, what did I actually do? So then how did you get yourself out of that that feeling, right? I know there's this there's this quote that I, I love. It's like, feel the fear and do it anyway, right? So what was that do it anyway game plan for you then? I actually, I stayed sad for a little while. I was a little sad. I, I wasn't directionless. That, that was the upside. I wasn't directionless. I was sad and working. So I did both. <laughs> I cried and I worked. I was a little bit sad because I just felt like, well, what do I do in this moment? I felt like the thing that people were proud of me for had started to disappear because people were proud that like I had this corporate job and I was working like the thing that people praised me for was how hard I worked. And it was just like, well, do people still say I'm a hard worker when I only have this one job that I'm kind of doing because I spend a lot of time being sad and working, (laughs) (laughs) you know, um, but I, I got myself out of it because at the end of the day, I still had bills to pay. I still had clients that expected um, the things that they ordered. Um, I was in commitment. So, you know, people had ordered wedding dresses. People had ordered occasion dresses. So the work still had to be done despite the fact that I was sad about where I was. And I don't think I was necessarily in a, a negative space. I wasn't in a negative space. I was in a confused space for sure. Talk to us about how, like, how something good came out of this confusing place for you. Yeah. So despite the fact that I was sad, I was I was still working. I think that was the the upside for me. People were Mm -hmm. still calling. Clients were still calling. Clients were still ordering. My money wasn't necessarily running short. It just felt short to me because it wasn't I had left something. I had left certainty. Um but I got on the phone and I started calling every client that I had in my Rolodex. Like, what do you need? <laughs> you need something? I needed to stay occupied because I knew that the sadness, it, it had an opportunity to take mm-hmm. over, but I didn't want it to. So I was calling every single client. They were putting in their orders. Um, I drove past a space in my neighborhood and I was just like, oh, this is about to be my store. I'm going to open a store. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open a store. And I didn't have any money. <laughs> I was like, did you have, were you going to open this store before you just, so you just saw it and you said you're going to open a store. That was, and it was a, it was, it was definite. It wasn't maybe I'll open a store. It was, I will open a store. I always knew that I wanted to open a store, okay. but I didn't actually know that like, you know, that's not where I thought life was leading me in that moment. In that moment, I was just kind of, I was so focused on making sure I was hustling that like, I didn't even think, oh, I'm going to open a store right now. I was driving and I said, I'm going to open this store. It was like almost like a random thought. Like, I'm going to open this store. And I I opened the store. I I don't know. Listen, I didn't have any money. Like, that's that's a whole story. I did not have any money. I had $4,000. That was it. I was doing um, pop-up shops every weekend. So it was like pop-up and sell every single weekend, Friday through Sunday, I would do a pop-up shop between Brooklyn and Manhattan. And Monday through Thursday, I would spend my time making the goods that I was going to sell during that weekend. And it was like rinse and repeat. It just keeps doing it over and over Mm -hmm. again. And at the end of that, I legitimately only had $4,000 to open this store. And I opened it on very little. 
um, I'm grateful for that because it has humbled me in a way that I don't think any other experience can because I know that you can make um, a lot out of a little. What were the biggest things that you had to experience or the biggest challenges that you had to navigate in those beginning years of operating a retail store, still being a designer and just like actually making Pintora a business with longevity? Like what were some of the challenges for you? Um, I think being young, um, a little naive, being young because selling wedding dresses and being unmarried is <laughs> what was an interesting experience. I think it was a ridiculous experience um, because I don't actually think that marriage validates you in any way. But it was so bizarre because there were people who just could not take me seriously. And if, if we're being really fair, I was so cute. I was so cute selling my little wedding dresses. <laughs> people would come into the showroom and actually tell me how cute I was. Like it was, it was so bizarre. So that was like one thing is, was people taking me serious. They saw the work and they were excited about what they saw, but it was just like, you're, you're cute. And I would get that so often that the cuteness, um, I think some people, it was hard for some people to kind of separate th them seeing this little tiny thing selling dresses that cost a substantial amount, right? So that was um, one difficult thing. I think um, being in the neighborhood that I was in, I purposely opened my store in Crown Heights because I wanted to kind of bring beauty to my neighborhood, which has kind of been an objective that I've had for a long time. And that's Brooklyn um, for non-New non York people. That's Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, right? So it's a neighborhood in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It's a neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, I wouldn't call it the hood. I definitely wouldn't call it the hood. Not but, anymore. Um, it's the, it's so different. It's Crown Heights is so gentrified in some ways now. There's just some parts still left. But, yeah, mm -hmm. those parts are gonna die out. Soon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I opened the store in Crown Heights. I wanted to kind of change the narrative about Black women getting married. Um, and all of my clients up to that point were white. I didn't really? know because they were all white because. I was selling wedding dresses online. And ah. so it was sight unseen. I didn't know who these people were. They didn't know who I was. Um, and when I did get pictures back, it was months later. And I remember there was a bride. Her name was Jamila. And I just knew, I just knew she was going to be my black bride. She sent me back a picture and she was just not black. She was not black. <laughs> I was just like, no, you know, I don't care who buys my dresses, but I do care that black women have an opportunity to buy it. It's open to everybody, but damn it, black women are going to have the opportunity to buy my wedding dresses. And so I knew that I had to actually create the opportunity by creating visibility. Um, open the store. It was, it was hard. People wanted us to be everything except a bridal store. Oh, you open in a hair salon? No, ma'am. No, I'm not. It's a bridal store. Oh, okay. We didn't need one of those in the community, but we did. But we did because y'all still going everywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was um that was one thing. Um, doing everything myself, which I have learned many times over that that is impossible. I ran every single job myself. I was the accountant. I was the receptionist. I was the seamstress. I was the designer. I was our lead marketing and advertising agent. I was, I was all of the things. Um, I'm grateful to not be all of the things anymore. For how long? Um, I probably did that for a solid year, year and a half. And okay. then I was able to hire my best friend who had, she had been helping me for free you don't get those type of people in life. Like you do hold those people near and dear, but she was helping me as if she was working for me full time until I was just like, this is not sustainable because you, you will either hate me later for all of the hard work that you've put in and have not received anything for. Yeah. And so once I was able to hire her, um, I, that's what I did. Um, I don't hire friends anymore though. <laughs> <laughs> that's another lesson. That could be a whole podcast episode, right? <laughs> it, it's another lesson. I'm grateful that the people that I have hired, um, who I am friends with that it, it never ended badly. It never ended on a sour note. I just know that I wouldn't do it again. I, I did that for about a year and a half. I was running every single consultation for maybe three years. I did all the consultations. Um, I don't do any of the consultations now unless we have like events and I'm then I'm like scheduled to be at the event. But I was running myself ragged. And what that does is it stops you from doing the thing that you're good at. Like I'm good at designing. I'm good at 
creating safe spaces. And that's what I wanted to do. But how do you do that when, you know, you're doing everything else? How are you also then making sure that you were building the Pantora bridal brand and even your own brand as a designer, right? Because I feel like people know of Pantora, but they also love who you are as a brand, who you are as a person and what you represent. I'm going to tell you that's one of my biggest struggles today is um, making sure that when people come to our showroom or even just when they buy something, they feel me in it because I know that my physical presence, it was so hard to sustain. Um, And so when we do hiring, we hire people not that are like me, but that people who really understand the culture of Pantora so that they can deliver that that thing. They can deliver the essence. Pantora is such a special place. And I say that because it's not just me that created that that special place. Like I built it, but the people who walk through our doors, our brides and our staff, like they, they are the one, they are the creators of that space. That hiring was really, really important. Hire people who understand and not just understand, but believe in, in the brand as you know it. Um, I'm grateful that people love me, but I realized that I wasn't going to be able to stay lovable if I was doing everything myself. Yeah, and especially if you wanted to grow, right? Because in 2016, you started, um, you you branched out into like offering Pantora with bigger, larger national retailers, right? Retailers were asking about the brand prior to that, and we were trying to get into stores for so many years um, before we actually got into the first store. And I don't think that we were necessarily ready, and I don't think that the industry was ready. And sometimes I still question its readiness. Why wouldn't the industry be ready? Well, bridal is a white male owned, uh, white woman run industry. Okay. 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 So, um, I don't, I don't think that, I think that when it's not broke, don't fix it. Kind of got, got real. It It got really real. I don't think that people were necessarily receptive to me and all, all my blackness and the styles that I created while the, they they are I don't know I don't know if I would say they're black women specific, but they're definitely designed with black women in mind. So anybody can wear it, but just know that I designed it for you. You know? Mm-hmm. Like I designed it so that when you're shopping for dresses, I'm understanding those curves. I'm understanding culture. I'm understanding that black people are fancy as hell. We fancy. It it was important to me to kind of just start to start to build Pantora and build like our following and build the culture of Pantora without the retailers because they weren't necessarily understanding. They weren't re- receptive of my brand. They did not understand at all. I even got questioned on, well, why did you choose this model? And I'm like, well, it's because she looks like me. <laughs> so they <laughs> wanted easy. you to have like the little stick figure. Uh, well, not, not like, I don't want to mean it like that. They wanted you to have what other, like the, the normal archetype for what a, a bridal model looks like for, for other brands. For sure. They wanted me to have what they could sell and what they were used to selling. And I kind of feel like when you're trying to create greatness, like you can't do what everybody else is doing. I wasn't willing to compromise my design sensibility and the way that I was marketing to just be in a few stores that I didn't feel like were going to work for us in the first place. Like I felt like, okay. And then when all of these black women come to your store, how will you treat them? Because that goes hand in hand. Do you understand their culture? Do you understand us? Do you understand what we're asking for? Are you going to talk me out of my booty showing in this dress? (laughs) You know, like I just, I just felt like, let me create this on my own. So I did, I created it on my own until 2016. I had, um, a retailer reached out to me that I felt like really understood the Pantora brand and wanted it for exactly what it was. And um, I said, well, if she exists, other people exist. And other people did exist slowly, but surely other people did exist, but it, it, we just made sure that we continued to grow our um, brand and our platform here in Brooklyn. And then we took our show on the road and we started to do tour stops across the country, which was amazing. We still do it super popular. I mean, dozens to hundreds of brides like show up to these tour stops and it, it's so amazing to kind of just, you have me like kind of thinking, Oh my God, like, look what, look what this, thing turned into this 2013 thing turned into in 2020. I was looking at a video um a couple weeks ago of one of our sample sale events and brides were lined up around the entire block. Wow. Like it it wrapped around the block and I showed up and I was just like, "Oh my god." Like, "Oh my god, like look what we created." You know, people always go, "Well, why don't you say look what 
you know, you created. But I, I say it because if black women did not shop my dresses, if women didn't come in and, and shop my dresses and show other people how amazing we were, like a hundred people wouldn't be lined up around the blog. Like it's just, it's amazing. Like look what we created. Yep. And I feel like, you know, you said black women specifically, and I feel like it's important for a black woman with gifts, with talents to not play, to not, to not like settle for the short end of the stick. You know what I mean? And to dream bigger because, you know, I'm looking at, so on your website, andreapitter.com, you have this timeline, right? And it shows the evolution. And a lot of times I feel like we can get stuck in being okay with where we are now, right? And not really mm-hmm. giving ourselves that space to really dream big and to evolve. Why is that so important for us as Black women? I feel like home is where the comfort is sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I mean, I just feel like, listen, God has a way of making me so uncomfortable. He's just like, I'm going to make this space feel so small. You're going to have to get out. You're going to have to get out. But I, I understand why people want to live very comfortably. And I think that it's absolutely fine. I think stay comfortable, stay comf- comfortable for a while, but you just know that you can't, you can't live there because comfort starts to turn um, into discomfort real quick. Yeah, It does. You have to, you have to keep moving. Moving is where comfort is. Imagine, imagine if your legs stop working and you're stuck in that one spot, that's not comfortable. You're supposed to move. That's where comfort is. Keep like, keep it going. Keep the momentum going. So what made you then say, all right, I got bridal down. Now I want to go into fabric sourcing. I want to be, I want to provide a destination for people to source these exclusive textiles and fabrics. How did, how did trap fabrics get, get, um, get launched? So I, I had a trip overseas and I was um, doing some sourcing and I was just like, you know what we don't have? We don't have, we don't have um, fabric stores run and operated by, by people of color. Um, and I was led by this one particular experience because I, I didn't say, Oh, I'm going to open a store once I, um, was doing some sourcing, but I had this experience where one of our vendors, they would just not treat me well. And I was dropping bands. Like I was dropping a lot of money. Um, and I mean, this account went from four figures, five figures, spending six figures with them in a year. And, you know, they just weren't necessarily treating me well. And when I say that, like my salesperson itself, she treated me all right. But when I would walk into their establishment, I would hear the whispers and I would hear people go, no, she's okay. She spends money. Like what? Right. <laughs> like, and I was just like, this is so unacceptable. This is not the experience we're supposed to have. There's been so many times when I walk into a fabric store just because that's one of the things that I, I enjoy doing is kind of just walking through the garment district in Manhattan and going into the fabric stores where I ask, oh, well, can I see this? And the, the response is, well, that's expensive. And I'm I'm like, if they only knew, <laughs> if they only knew. And I just felt like that's not the experience that designers are supposed to have, especially those starting up. If you're met with that type of aggression when you go into a fabric store, imagine how your dreams would would fizzle out because people think that your projects are smaller, that you're small. There's been times where I'm just like, I don't want to deal with this fabric store. You know, I, I don't want to do this project anymore. Or you're you're afraid to ask questions. You should not have to be afraid to ask a question, especially when you're making a purchase. And I just felt like trap fabrics was needed because you're met with you're met with friendly salespeople. You're met with people who will help guide you through a project if you need assistance. Um, we're gonna celebrate your small wins and your big wins. Um, these fabric stores legitimately looked at me solely like a purchase, and I felt like it was fine. But you can't look at me as a purchase and disrespect me as well. Yep. Were you nervous then about launching this new venture, especially because you were still running? Well, you know, you were still heading up Pantora. This is now a separate establishment, another retail space, right? You do have a retail space. I know now you guys are online because of COVID, but before you you had a retail space. Yeah, so we had a retail space for Trap Fabrics. We'll probably um, be reopening. We're relocating it right now because of COVID. Okay. So um, we're looking for another location. But no, you know, it's funny. I was not scared. And I, it, it's very interesting. Other things scare me, but this doesn't. Stuff like this doesn't. Um, I'm kind of fearless when it comes to running a business. I am not necessarily afraid of failing because in all honesty, I know a lot of amazing women. I know a lot of amazing people who, who have achieved amazing things. And those people, when they share their stories with me, they're full of like 
they're, they're full of failures. Yeah. I don't know a winner who hasn't failed. And so I'm not really afraid of failing. I'm afraid of my failures affecting um, other people. But as far as like falling on my face, okay, those types of things, I don't think I'm, I'm really affected by it. Um, I am, a, I, I do not like shortcomings affecting other people though. What was the hardest part about getting trap fabrics off the ground? Getting people to kind of change the way that they were shopping in the first place. I think people were kind of used to their treatment, tr- the treatment they were receiving when they shopped. They're just used to their, um, the fabric vendors that they had. And so like getting them to make the switch and, um, getting them comfortable with ordering with us was, um, difficult, um, but trap fabrics, it felt very natural to me. It still feels natural. Um, I hire people that I adore um, because I feel like they they understand the culture and they th- we call them trap keepers. So the trap keepers, they're amazing. Um, and so I legitimately get to put out my ideas and they execute them. So this was a little bit different because I went into trap fabrics with experience, whereas Pantora Bridal, I was winging a whole lot of it. Yeah, but you know, without the Pantora, right? It makes sense without Pantora and all that experience, then your your experience then launching trap fabrics would have been completely different. For sure, <laughs> for sure, trap fabric. I don't think I would have gotten to trap fabrics without Pantora. There's no way because I wouldn't have even understand understood what it was that I was trying to offer. Like, what is the purpose of trap fabrics? Every every space or every business that I create, um, a lot of it is rooted in creating safe safe places for whoever our target market is. And for Pantora, it's creating a safe space for black women to be able to shop for wedding dresses. It's providing amazing fashion with a luxurious experience and trap fabrics. It's allowing a platform, an educational platform while you shop. As you were speaking, the thing that really came to mind was that's why it's so important to just get started on the journey. A lot of us, sometimes we spend so much time in in park. You know, I have this visual thing with with our dream drivers. We spend so much time in park, but not realizing that drive is where it's at, right? Like, even Uh if you don't know where you're going, just actually putting the car in drive, getting on the road, experiencing, meeting people, building relationships, it, that's what leads you to the next step, right? That's what leads you to the point where you got to put it in part because now you got things to work on. Exactly. I feel like that, that put it in drive. Like, I love that idea. Like, put it in drive. Every morning, I probably, I start my conversation with my husband, like, oh, I bought a domain. He's like, what, what do you mean? I'm like, I, I bought a domain name and I had an idea. <laughs> He's just like, you, what? You're, are you collecting domain names? I'm like, no, I'm collecting ideas. I'm collecting ideas and I'm, I'm just, this is how I put it into drive. I buy a domain name. I make it LLC. Like this is, this is how I do it. Um, it's an idea. It's, it stays an idea until you put some action and effort behind it. And every single action will get you a little bit further. You know, you have the idea, you buy the domain, you turn it into LLC, you buy your first product, you sell your first product. Like, you know, you have to act. And if you're trying to figure out how to get where you're going, you actually have to go. Yeah. Um, so I was stalking your Instagram, right? I, I accidentally liked a picture from uh, like a long time ago while I was stalking it uh, this morning. Um, but one of the things I noticed that I loved is like you work a lot with Keisha Lambert. Is it Lambert? Is that how you say her last name? Um, yeah, and you Kesha, guys, Kesha Lambert. You Kesha, and you you um you create these stunning visuals, right? Um, as a marketer. Why is having this visual identity for your brands like how does how do you think that has really helped um help you get customers but also just help you build the brand as well? I kind of think talk is cheap, right? Like I'm going to keep telling you like I have to actually show you. I want to show you it, but I want to show show it to you in motion. Like I want you to see you know Pantora and all its grandeur. Kesha is so great at kind of um allowing me to say this is what I want and helping me execute it. Um, I want black women to see themselves in these amazing venues and these outlandish hairstyles and to be portrayed as art. And every single time um, I work with our social media um, rep and we're talking about what posts we're, posts we're going to um, share in our content, I'm like, listen, we need to make sure that we're showing black women as the art that we are. Mm-hmm. And you know, in order to do that, I have to create the content for it. So whenever Kesha and I are talking, like right now we're talking about a project where 
I'm like the afro. Let's make the afro out of flowers. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yep. Let's do let's do a three foot diameter afro out of flowers. And she's like, let's go for it. I'm like, we have to be shown as artwork. We have to. And, you know, the visuals are super important. I want people to be able to see that I'm serious about the things that I actually say. Andrea, this is something that, you know, COVID-19, March, it hit us with a bang, right? I know a lot of us weren't expecting just how much it would impact our business and how much we would have to shift. How did that impact? How did the, the, um, because there's no weddings going on, right? People weren't necessarily, they weren't renting out venues. The the idea of a wedding has shifted. How did that impact your business? And, you know, how did you guys navigate that, that change? COVID, um, COVID-19, I, I'm telling you, it wanted to kick my whole butt. <laughs> mm-hmm. It wanted to kick my butt. Um, and not in the sense of will Pantora come back or will it not? It was the fact that I understand very well that in when it comes to weddings that brides feel like they are by themselves because they are they in their group they are the person getting married right but in our group we are dealing with hundreds of brides so when covid happened every person and not just brides every person took it like a personal blow and it was exceptionally important for me to have my staff understand that we have to figure out how to be sympathetic while we deal with our own ish. Every single bride, we we had comments and posts and all type of stuff where brides are like, I've been crying all week. And, you know, it's just sad because it's like I'm a twofold person because I'm also a realist. And I, I kind of I just think that um, for me, it was like, OK, well, it's happening and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. But you don't get to say that to a bride. You don't get to say, my bad, COVID's happening. I mean, you do get to kind of set realistic expectations for them. But, you know, how do you not lead empathetically? And so many people felt like my wedding is canceled. And 30,000 weddings happen every week in the U.S. Wait, every week? Mm-hmm. I thought you were going to say every mm-hmm. year. But that doesn't make sense. But that's the, wow. Wow. It, you know, when, when people are like, my wedding is canceled. And you know that, like, no, no, no everybody's wedding is canceled. (laughs) It's like, how do you, how do you articulate that? Because you don't want to remove, um, you don't want to remove that person feeling like it's about them, but it, it, uh, listen, like I said, COVID, COVID was prepared to kick my whole tail because I just felt like this is so unprecedented. We are managing people's expectations. We're managing their experiences, but we're also managing their feelings. And feelings are very hard to manage. People, Other people's feelings are very, very hard to manage because feelings live on a spectrum. And there were some brides who, they were cool. Well, COVID's happening. <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. <laughs> and then there were other brides, oh my God, everything is ruined. Everything I planned for over the last two years is ruined. And I'm just like, love is it. Love still here, guys. <laughs> and you, you also know, have but- a business to run too, right? And it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you balance that? Because that, that was hard. My team, they were writers. They were writers. I think this was one of the, the few times that they've um, either heard me cry because I'm crying on like a Zoom call. Because I'm like, guys, I'm trying. This is the best thing I can do. I didn't, um, I didn't furlough any employees. Um, and I was at the end of the day, I was like, listen, you, you guys are you guys are a part of the reason Pantora stands. And so I'm going to try and stand for you guys as long as we can. So that it was, it was hard because at the end of the day, there's no guarantees. I felt like I was one of the lucky ones that knew that post COVID we would get to come back because so many businesses are not coming back. They're not coming back. Um, I understood that we would come back because, you know, the wedding industry, I'm booking brides anywhere between six months and two years in advance. So we have brides booked into 2022. So we kind of, you know, I was able to kind of understand really what's happening with my business. I mean, still, there's no, there's absolutely no guarantees ever, but I can legitimately make sense of what's in front of me. And once I kind of got a hold of my personal feelings, because I'm also like, like those brides who were just like, oh my God, COVID is happening to me. I took my second, I had my pity party. I stayed for one dance and I got out. It it was difficult because I have a staff who's asking me the same things. Well, when do we get to reopen? And I'm like, guys, 
I'm watching the news with you guys. The governor is going to allow us when the governor allows us to reopen. There's absolutely nothing I can do. These are people who legitimately love their job. At one point, the manager goes, I'm going to the store regardless. (laughs) (laughs) Then do what? (laughs) That's that's what I said. I said, sis, stay home, please. Just stay home because I need you to be healthy and stay for me. So when we can come back, we're coming back and we're, you know, hitting the ground running. But, you know, people are attached to what we've built. Not just not just the staff, but, you know, the client's are as well. Like I've, I've created that safe space. So people want to come back. Um, I've had to change gears. I've had to offer things. Some of our COVID happened during our highest sales season. So, you know, we're at the height of sales season and literally everything is shut down. No sales are coming in nothing's happening. And then I'm just like, okay, how well am I prepared for, for this? And I had to start getting creative. I'm like, okay, well, what do we do? We started offering virtual appointments. We started letting people know of our other, you know, the other services that we offer. We offer wedding gown preservation. We started to really kind of get creative, started to work on how, how we can really, you know, hit the ground running when we get back. We can make up for the lost time. We've been at home for three months. This is, today is the first day. It's crazy to think about. Yeah, we're, this is the first day we're open. And we're not even open at full capacity. So it's it's so insane to really think about. I, I We were having Zoom calls with our team biweekly. And at some point, I had to tell them, I'm checking out of these Zoom calls. And I want you guys to operate them when you are mentally able. Because, you know, I'm asking people who are probably going through their own ish to be 100%, you know, mentally available to a business that can't actually be in operation. I had to ask them to really take care of themselves emotionally and mentally. Um, and so, so that when we did have these grand meetups that, you know, they can be fruitful instead of, Hey, I'm just calling to check in because what are we checking in on? Nothing was happening. (laughs) Nothing was happening. And so I said, I, you know, these check-ins are going to have to turn into wellness check-ins and that's what they were. We were checking in on each other just to make sure that we were sane. And we needed that, or they they probably needed that. I know, like along these past three months, like just even being pregnant during during COVID, right? Like no one plans. You no one can you, you no one could have ever said, "All right, in life, you need to plan for you might just have a global health pandemic," right? <laughs> like that's not something that that comes with the life exactly. manual. So exactly. it really is about like knowing or being open to just pivoting and being open to realizing that. There is no GPS and there's no set GPS in life, right? And you really got to be willing to just go where it tells you. Oh, sorry, wait, I made a mistake. Turn around, you know, Siri voice. Mm-hmm. Turn around, <laughs> can't go there. This was not a case of the strongest survive. COVID nineteen was not a case of the strongest survive when it came to entrepreneurship. It was not. It just was not. Every business structure is structured so different. Some people make their money in one quarter of the year, they make the money that's needed for the entire year in one quarter. Imagine if that quarter was wiped out. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people are solely operating on brick and mortar and they can't run their businesses online. Like, you know, this was not a matter of the strongest survive. This was a matter of circumstance. Like there was just a matter of circumstance. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that Today we get to walk in and those doors are still there. Nobody chained us up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's like, I'm grateful for that. That's not the reality for a lot of entrepreneurs. It's not. And some people are going to rebuild and come back stronger. And I think that's, that's going to be the most beautiful thing is that when things like this happen, not that we've ever seen a pandemic, right? But when things like this happen, there's amazing things that are grown from it. And so I'm really excited to see like D nice. I mean, D nice was always the ish, right? Mm -hmm. But look like he's getting his flowers. He's getting his flowers. Look at Hanifa. Hanifa launched that virtual fashion show, um, a couple weeks ago, like, you know, in innovation, we're getting to witness this innovation because everybody was standing still. So we're able to deliver people their flowers because we're all still look at the protests. If everybody was doing their normal hustle and bustle, people wouldn't have, wouldn't have even been able to pay the type of attention that we've been able to, to, you know, to pay towards racial injustice. So I'm, I mean, while COVID kicked my whole ass, 
I'm grateful for the standstill because we got to open our eyes. Yeah. As you were talking, the thing that I wrote down was crisis breeds creativity, right? Crisis breeds innovation. And sometimes we think of crisis as this bad thing, but sometimes it's like really turning lemons into lemonade. Like, what can you make out of it? What can you learn? How can you better yourself? I know that's something that I've been thinking about for these three past months. So just hearing you talk about how you were able to navigate that, I think it's just really inspiring and also really encouraging. Like, there will be dark times along this road but that doesn't mean that you can't find a light or you don't realize you are the light you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and you you know what too and this this is probably the unpopular opinion COVID-19 allowed people the opportunity to get out of an unhappy place or space yep. it allowed it allowed entrepreneurs who decided I don't want to do this anymore to get out it allowed people who did not have um, who were not happy in their nine to fives to be like, Ooh, this is my, this is my opportunity to get into entrepreneurship. It, it, uh, it allowed space and clarity. It really did. Yeah. Cause I don't think a lot of people realize just how much they might have not really been enjoying what life really is about. Does that make sense? Like, I feel like a lot of mm-hmm. families had to get closer. A lot of, like, you just had to do a lot of self-reflection. It might not have always have been easy, but there definitely were things that we all learned about ourselves as people. Um, and the thing that I wanted to ask you is, like, along this whole dream driving journey, what's that thing that you learned about learned about yourself and your own, you know, capabilities, your own abilities? I learned how human I actually am. During this time, I was able to really kind of spend time with my child that I I didn't take the opportunity. And I say take because um, I'm sure that I could have found the time, but I did not take the time. Um, I was carrying him on my hip every step of the way when I fly to Asia or when I fly to Europe, like he was on my hip. But that's not necessarily quality time. That's just taking him with me. Mm-hmm. And and so like I really kind of got to change the way that I was being a parent. And while I thought I was being an amazing parent then, but I'm, I'm an amazing parent today. Like (laughs) no one can take that away from me. My child has grown so much in the last three months. Um, I've humanized myself a little bit. I've learned that I cannot do everything. I've realized where I was trying to do everything. And then I realized how much I can create when I do the thing that I'm good at. I reassigned roles uh, within my business. I've taken a lot of weight off of myself and redistributed it a little bit. Um, I've sat down and really got to design some amazing stuff. Can't wait till y'all see it. (laughs) (laughs) I've been able to, you know, start the launches on some other projects and I wouldn't have been able to do that because I would have been in my, you know, normal hustle and bustle. If you've ever like followed me on Instagram, you can just watch me go, 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 and you'll get exhausted yourself. And I think um, I'm really grateful for that time where I was able to sit down and go, girl, you, you can't, you can't do that anymore. Like you cannot keep, you can't run yourself ragged. Cause I was running myself into the ground. So what's next? Like what's, what are you working on? Where do you see, you know, you just, you just said that today was the first day that you guys opened doors after three months of being in quarantine. How do you see the, the, the Pantora journey, the, the Andrea journey evolving? Uh, ooh, those are two separate things. Wow. All right, so first the Pantora, <laughs> and then and then you. <laughs> so the Pantora, we're launching. I'm um, ready to wear a line soon. Congrats! Um, thank you. We just um we opened right before COVID. We opened our fitting suite. We launched a fitting suite for brides. So when they purchase their Pantora gowns, they go to another location to have like an intimate fitting experience. And so we kind of like it was like shut down basically a week after we opened it. And so um, now we can kind of continue building that. Um, we're working on opening other locations and expanding our retailership. So we've been in talks with so many new stores that are interested in carry, carrying the Pantora brand. Um, so we should, we should have way more um, shopping opportunities for brides across the country and um internationally because I've spoken to a few stores that want to carry our brand outside of the country. So I see nothing but expansion for Pantora. And as far as myself is concerned, um, I won't recognize who I am by next year. I'm a whole new person. I've, I've gotten more therapy in over the last three months. Um, I really love the person that I'm 
that I am and the person I'm becoming. Um, my entrepreneurship journey is looking so much different now. And I respect, I respect the journey that I, I have been on and I'm excited to kind of redirect the one I'm going on. (laughs) And so, um, you know, I'm excited for the peace that I'm experiencing in my life. And what does that peace feel like to you? It feels like fresh air. I feel like, um, and I think it's important because I don't want to send mixed messages um, about entrepreneurship and about dreaming because I think there is there is a lot of hustle that is necessary to have your dreams come to fruition. But I think when you've had your head down and you've done the work for so long, it's important that you come up for air. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even though we hired more people and we expanded so much you just started to swim in a different um, pool. You didn't come up for air. And I think that like, you know, now has been my time to kind of come up and kind of see what land looks like. (laughs) Yeah. I get to keep swimming, but now I get to remind myself to come up. Oh, I love that. That's like the perfect ending to like a book, you know, (laughs) that was, that was so good. Um, you know, Andrea, if you want to be a dream driver, right, you have to have your keys to success, right? You have to have those things that, or those key things that just, you carry everywhere with you, right? What would you, what would you say are the things that you, that dream drivers need in their toolkit before they hit the road? Three things. Um, so one thing I would say is your why you need to know what your why is, what your purpose is so that every single time you you're on route and you feel like you're going to derail, you can come back to your purpose and your, the why you're doing what it is that you're doing. Um, secondly, I think that a mentor Or someone you really trust to kind of let you know when you're derailing is important. Someone who's honest. And they don't necessarily need to be honest in regards to the product or the service and whether they like it or not. But someone who's will honestly tell you that you're off your game. Thirdly, a good book. One of those books that kind of make you think. One that you can go back and reference. Um, My favorite book is uh, The Defining Decade. I just think a a really good book that makes you sit down and just be still is important. I love that. I'm going to have to check that one out. I love it. I feel like I, it's funny because I feel like I used to, I was such a book head as a kid. Um, And you know how like you just, you default to finding things online. I feel like I need to like go through, I need to go on a book, a book, uh, just on a book splurge and just get some new books. I definitely feel like I have not, up to my book catalog in a while. So I'm going to add that one to my list. I did during um, this whole quarantine thing mm-hmm. we were on and I bought like a good 20 books and I've read like three. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you I, got I a lot more time. Know <laughs> I know. I'm like, next time, just buy two books, Andrea. Just buy two books that you want to read because now I just have a bookshelf full of books and I'm just like, do I even want to read this one? But I, I'm sure I'll find some time to read them. So where can our dream drivers find you online if they want to connect to Andrea? So you can visit us at PantoraBridal.com and um, you can read about Pantora Bridal there, but you can also read about me at AndreaPitter.com. All right. Thank you so much, Andrea. This has been such a, like, I'm so, I feel so pepped up now. I'm like, all right, I'm about to go turn my air conditioner on, stop sweating and uh, (laughs) get to work, right? (laughs) I'm I'm excited. Thank you for having me. it's always interesting to kind of tell my story because I feel like I've been doing this so long that sometimes my memory is like, well, wait, 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 wait. Well, how did this happen? Oh, I remember exactly how it happened. So, and reflecting on it, as you me. said, makes you realize just how great a story it is. Yeah, I really have to write a lot of this stuff down because this has been, I've been doing this more than half my life at this point. I, I created Pantera at 12, I'm 31. Um, this is like, this is what I've been doing. <laughs> and to jot out some notes <laughs> alright so that was a wrap for episode 246 with Andrea I hope you enjoyed hearing her dream driving journey as well as her keys to success If you love this episode, guys, you know what I'm going to say. Please make sure that you are sharing it with your communities and across social media. Screenshot it, share the link, do whatever. But just make sure you're forwarding this to at least one person who you think will be inspired by Andrea's story. You can find us across the board on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dreams and Drive. And make sure you're using the hashtag Dreams and Drive when sharing as well. If you want to get our weekly newsletter, The Keys, 
Just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash join to sign up. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash join to sign up. And a lot of you guys have been asking me, hey, Raina, how can we support the show? How can we give back? How can we support you? So, guys, there are two ways. You can make sure you get some Dreams and Drive merchandise. Just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash shop to order your Dreams and Drive aprons, T-shirts, or crew neck sweatshirts. Or you can go to dreamsanddrive.com slash donate. We do have a Patreon community, so for $5 a month, you can support the show, and that really does go a long way. So that's dreamsanddrive.com slash donate if you want to support in that way. Lastly, lastly, guys, please make sure wherever you're listening to this right now, this is your first time and you want to make sure you can go back and listen to all the episodes or you want to make sure that you get notifications every time we have a new episode. Just hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to us so that you'll always have Dreams and Drive locked and loaded and ready to go. And if you're listening to us, especially on Apple Podcasts, I ask that you please leave us a rating and review. Those ratings mean a lot and those reviews really mean a lot as well. So make sure you just go into the Apple Podcasts app, search Dreams and Drive, click on leave a rating and review, and then you can do your thing from there. All right, as always, guys, keep dreaming, keep driving, and we'll chat again in episode 247. Bye, guys.